Hello, this is the third part of a set of five videos on the physicalists. Today I want to briefly describe the work of Johannes Muller and Ernst Weber, two early 19th century German thinkers who made major contributions to the understanding of physiological psychology and as such can be seen as precursors to the emergence of modern scientific psychology. The two men were roughly contemporaries, Weber being six years older than Muller. Both achieved academic eminence, Muller at the University of Berlin in the capital of the Kingdom of Prussia and Weber at the University of Leipzig, then the intellectual center of the rival Kingdom of Saxony. Most of their key work relating to psychology was published in the 1820s and 1830s. Johannes Müller was born in Koblenz in the German Rhineland in 1801, the son of a cobbler. An energetic young man, he graduated as a doctor at the age of 21 and later began lecturing at the University of Bonn on physiology and anatomy, becoming a full professor when he was only 29. In 1833, he was appointed to the newly created chair of physiology at the University of Berlin becoming the key figure in the establishment of physiology as a modern scientific discipline and attracting many able students who themselves became major figures in the field. He continued to work at the University of Berlin until his death in 1858 at the young age of 56. He wrote extensively on a variety of subjects but although increasingly interested in zoology and comparative anatomy is now best remembered for his early work on physiology, especially his studies of vision and the nervous system. Of particular importance was his concept of specific nerve energy, which can be seen as a fundamental contribution to the development of what became physiological psychology. According to Muller, each type of sensory process, seeing, hearing, tasting and so on, was enabled by a specific physiological mechanism involving the appropriate sense organ, a nerve and the brain. The sensory apparatus of one sense could not be used by another. Thus, whilst blind people developed extraordinary powers of touch, they did not see with their fingers and in the simple experiment of gently pressing one's fingers on the closed eye one experiences specific visual sensations, flashes of light, and not sound or anything else. Muller also insisted that sensation is a physiological rather than philosophical question. What we see or hear in the outside world leads to changes in the various sensory systems and these changes in turn are then transmitted to the brain. For example, seeing involves the formation of images on the retina. What was perceived corresponded to external reality. The philosophical conundrums of Berkeley, Hume and Kant were transformed into observable and testable realities. Philosophically, Muller is an interesting transitional figure. On the one hand, he was a pioneer in developing a strictly mechanical understanding of the functioning of the nervous system and the processes of sensation. But at the same time, he located this work within a vitalist perspective. Was the soul, for example, simply the brain and nervous system in action, or a separate vital force that temporarily inhabited the body? Muller's vitalism was in obvious contrast with the mechanistic views of his most eminent students, which later came to prevail, and his own philosophical ideas came to be entirely forgotten. We now turn to Ernst Weber. Weber was born in Wittenberg in Saxony in 1795. He first studied medicine before being appointed to teach anatomy and physiology at the University of Leipzig first as a lecturer and later as a professor. He remained in Leipzig for the remainder of his life and died in 1878 in his 83rd year. His relevance to the history of psychology stems from several important experiments he devised to test perceptual sensitivity, but during his lifetime he was also well known for his discoveries in anatomy and the test he developed to evaluate hearing loss. His key work on perception concerned two different aspects. First, 
variations in skin sensitivity, and secondly, just noticeable differences in sensory awareness. In both areas, Weber was able to invent simple but crucial experiments to test his ideas. To test variations in skin sensitivity, he merely put the two points of a draftsman's compass onto the skin at different parts of the body and varied the distance between the two points to measure at what critical distance the subject could only sense one rather than two points. The variations were considerable. On the tip of the tongue, less than one twentieth of an inch could be detected. On the cheeks, half an inch along the backbone only up to two and a half inches, a more than fifty-fold range of sensitivities. As we now know, this indicates the relative density of nerve endings in each area. Weber later moved on to the more complex question of what he referred to as just noticeable differences. How different do two stimuli have to be before the difference can be detected? For example, how much heavier does a given weight have to be before one notices that it is heavier? This is easy to test. One can ask volunteers to lift two weights in succession from a graduated series of weights and say which is heavier, or the volunteer can be asked to lift a weight to which one adds progressively greater increments and ask them when they notice the increased weight. Using these simple techniques, Weber was able to identify the smallest difference that his subject could perceive, the just noticeable difference. As he had suspected, a pattern of perception could be identified. The just noticeable difference was not a specific unvarying weight, but varied according to the initial weight. The heavier the first weight, the greater the difference had to be before it would be perceived and these differences followed a specific pattern. Uh, thus, for weights, he calculated that the just noticeable difference was one-fortieth. That is, a oh, second weight had to be one-fortieth heavier than the first for the subject to notice the difference. He also tested other sensory systems, always finding that the smallest difference that we can perceive between two stimuli is not a fixed amount, but varies according to the strength of the stimuli and that there was a standard ratio between the two. He also discovered that the constant varied from one system to another. Thus, vision was the most sensitive of the senses. An increase in one sixtieth in the intensity of light was noticed. At the other extreme, differences in the strength of a taste were not readily perceived, with a JND of one third. The differences for other senses varied between these. For pain, for example, the JND was one thirtieth, for pitch perception one tenth, for smell only a quarter. These simple experiments were of enormous importance. They enabled Weber to make the first quantitatively precise statement of the relationship between physical and psychological phenomena. They therefore became the prototype of the kind of generalization that experimental psychologists later came to look for. In general, we can note how revolutionary Weber's experiments were. In the 1830s, when Weber was doing this research, academic psychology remained philosophical in nature. In Britain, for example, James Mill continued to promulgate traditional associationism, whilst in Germany, Johann Friedrich Herbert, occupying Kant's chair at Königsberg, still maintained Kant's assertion that psychology could never be an experimental science. At the same time, at a popular level, phrenology continued to attract crowds of enthusiasts, including many who were eminent and well-educated. In this context, Weber did some of the first true psychology experiments, laying the basis for its later development as an experimental science. We can also note that whilst other physiologists were researching reflexes and nerve transmission, Weber was looking at the entire sensory system and the mind's interpretation of nerve responses.